Welcome back. Today we're going to have a discussion about spatial weights matrices and some things to think about. And then we're going to make some spatial weights matrices using Joda. And we'll talk about how to save and export these files and how to import them into other software such as MATLAB and R. We won't go into the details, but we'll talk about basically how that's done. Just so you know, this handout I'm going to make available on my website at spatial.berkeyacademy.com. Click on files or find the, this video and I'll have a link there as well. And uh, I'll call it making spatial weights.pdf in the file list. Although I might put some number at the beginning, I've got a crazy numbering scheme and I'm trying to figure out a way that makes sense about that. I have a link here to my playlist of all my videos in this series on spatial regression and, and spatial statistics and all that kind of stuff. I suggest you watch this video first in the list that was in Excel looking at contiguity matrices and how to calculate spatial correlation. So let's go ahead and get started. There are a lot of ways that you can define areas as neighbors to one another. And it's just one more modeling choice that you have to make whenever you are doing spatial regression. So how should you do it? Given that you have so many choices, well, it's probably no surprise to hear that there's not one right answer. You're gonna to have to think about it. So that's my number one suggestion is you need to just think about how you should define neighbors. And that's one of the great things about using Joda is it helps you visualize how the neighbors have actually been defined and created so that you can see if the resulting output of who are neighbors to whom makes sense to you. So think about it. If you're using counties, what makes sense according to whatever it is you're studying? Does distance matter more than being next to each other in terms of counties? Is there some cutoff in terms of distance that seems reasonable? Just think about it. And this is my advice for everything when it comes to econometrics. Seriously sit down and think about all of your modeling choices. But some constraints that you have to live within. Number two, you cannot have islands. So an island is a region that does not have any neighbors. So for example, if you were defining neighbors based on contiguity, whether things are next to each other, and you had, say, the 50 United States, and you have Alaska, well, Alaska doesn't touch any of the other states, and neither does Hawaii, that's a problem. You have to fix that somehow. So you cannot have islands. If you try to do these calculations and you have some regions that have no neighbors, it just doesn't work that way. So you can't have islands. Now, on the opposite extreme, another thing to think about. I have heard many people who do spatial econometrics and spatial statistics say that it's probably not a good idea to define all areas as neighbors to all other areas. Where this happens most often is if you're using a distance-based weight with no cutoff. By that I mean you want to, in your model, have farther away things have a lower weight, closer things have a larger weight. So you might construct weights based on one over the distance. As distance gets larger, the weight gets smaller, or whatever distance squared. But if you do that and you include all of the regions in your study, all of them will be neighbors to all the others. It's just further away things will be less so. Which, hey, that makes a lot of sense if you believe in Tobler's Law. Tobler's Law basically says that everything affects everything else, but closer things more so. That's fine. But some people worry. Later on in this series, I'm going to try to do some interviews with some people who are experts in these areas and ask them some of these questions and get them to elaborate on exactly why some of these things are a bad idea. But when it comes to this basic idea here, in most models, not all, but in most models, especially if you have a uh, lag Y, say a spatial lag model, all areas in the math, when you look at how these weights matrices work, all areas are neighbors to each other anyway, because my neighbor's value of Y affects me, but their neighbors affect them, and their neighbors affect them, and so there's this lag of lag of lag of lag effect. And again, we'll go through this more as we get into estimating these models and, and how that works and why it's important. So it's not really necessary 
in most of the flavors of spatial econometric models to define everybody as neighbors. And I've been told that that can cause some problems. We'll come back and address that later on in some interviews that I hope to do. I think, again, this is just one of my core principles. I think that when you make a modeling decision, it should make sense. It should be well thought out. However, a lot of people have heard about this paper and it's by Jim LeSage and Kelly Pace. Let me just show you that paper really quickly. Most of the papers I'm gonna show you, including this one, are open access. Yeah, I've got a link there in this paper, but you can Google it, it's open access. The biggest myth in spatial econometrics. And the argument here is that your choice of spatial weights matrix, matrix actually doesn't matter that much. Let's elaborate on that just a bit. What Lesage and Pace did in this paper is through some mathematics and also through using some real data, they argue that for the spatial autoregressive model, and for, which is another way of what I call the lag model, so different people call these models by different names. So the SAR is a lag model, also the spatial Durbin model. For these two models, they show pretty convincingly with math and also with some data that even though the slope coefficients that you get from a model are going to be sensitive to the choice of your spatial weights matrix when you calculate the marginal effects properly. When you calculate how the effect of the value in one region is going to affect the values in neighboring regions, the marginal effects estimates are not that sensitive to the choice of spatial weights matrices. They do not cover all the possible models that are out there. For instance, they don't look at the SLX model where you just have spatially lagged X variables. So don't overgeneralize what Lesage and Pace are trying to say here. And what they give is not a formal proof that this is always true, but they give some convincing arguments that this is probably usually the case. Marginal effects are not gonna be affected too much by your choice of spatial weights matrix for some kinds of models, right? So it's not a blanket statement. Another thing you need to know about weights matrices is spatial weights matrices need to be standardized. And we talked about this a little bit in my Excel video where we made a spatial weights matrix by hand for a fictional little area that we created. I highly recommend if you didn't watch that to go watch that. Standardized, there are a lot of ways you can do it for the queen or the rook, so queen means you're a neighbor if you have a shared boundary or a shared corner. Rook only a shared boundary, but not if regions just intersected a corner. Or for k nearest neighbors, that's where you pick, you take say the centroid of a region and you, for every region, its neighbors are the k, five nearest neighbors, or k could be four, or k could be 10 nearest neighbors. So 10 nearest neighbors, or if you have uh, defined neighbors as everybody within 10 miles is a neighbor, you wanna row standardize those weights. And we talked a little bit about why that is. Let's talk about row standardization. Now there are a lot of ways you can standardize. Row standardization is kind of the simplest and most straightforward approach. And let's just talk about what row standardization means. If a region has five neighbors, then you make each of the weights Instead of one, you make them one fifth. And what that does is it makes the total impact on me, it gives a fifth of the weight to each of my five neighbors. The good, simple, easy to understand thing about that is then you can interpret the lag variable that is going into the model just as a simple mean, simple average of the neighbor's values. Here's the Mansky model, which we're never actually gonna estimate, but it just gives the most complete representation to think about this. Row standardized K nearest neighbors or queen or rook would be to say, look, my value for Y, say crime rates, is some function of rho times WY. Here, WY would just be the average crime rate of my neighbors, however we're defining neighbors, plus X beta. This is some slope coefficients times my own explanatory variables, WX theta. Well, WX here would just mean the average value of the explanatory values for my neighbors. So that could be income. So what's the average income of my five neighbors or my six neighbors or my 10 neighbors, depending on how that was defined? Or if we have a spatially lagged 
uh, error term here, then this lambda wu would just be wu is what's the average value of the residual term for my neighbors. And lambda is just something we're going to estimate that says what part of my residual is based on or explained by my neighbor's residuals here. Now, other ways that you can define neighbors, and again, think about what's right for you. I'm just presenting some of the options. There are many others that people have come up with over the years, and I'll give you a couple of references at the end of this little handout section and before we get into Joda at the bottom of the handout here. So other ways that I think are interesting and intriguing are inverse distance weighted or some other kind of strength-based weighting that you might come up with where you want things that are closer in some sense to be stronger neighbors and things that are further away in whatever sense. It might be a distance. It might be sometimes people will define neighbors for non-spatial kinds of studies. So whatever strength or connection that you're using as your measure, you could row standardize those things, but sometimes other people have suggested, let's take the largest element of the matrix. So suppose we're using a distance-based matrix and we're doing one over the distance. Well, just look in your entire matrix and find the largest value of one over the distance. So maybe one of the distances is a half mile or a half of a kilometer then one over a half would be two. Divide all of your weights by two as a way of standardizing. Another interesting suggestion is to divide by the largest eigenvalue. And in R, there's a function in R in the SPDIP library called eigenw. I've heard this suggestion mentioned in several articles that I've read and several books I've read. I've never seen a really good explanation of why this is. Here's a paper that I'm reading right now just to explore this a little bit. It's a paper by Boots and Royal, and the citation is Geographical Analysis, 1991, volume 23, number three. This paper goes through using the maximum eigenvalue as a way to standardize weights matrices. And I've read through a little bit of it, but I haven't quite gotten into the meat of this. If I find something really interesting, I'll come back and discuss this a little bit. But that's another way that people have suggested standardizing, especially these distance-based weight matrices. There's another kind of weights that you see people talk about a lot, although I haven't seen these implemented in many of the standard packages that I've looked at, say in MATLAB or R. Maybe I just haven't seen them. One is called Cliff Ord Weights, where the idea is that the weight you give between region I and J is a function in the numerator of how long is the border that they share, some function of that and you see this exponent here. And so the longer the border, the higher the weight, but then on the bottom, the distance would be in the denominator. So the higher the distance, say away that the population center in the regions are apart, you're gonna give them lower weights. Alpha and beta are parameters that you can specify any way you want, but one way that often people choose alpha is to raise the distance squared. And this gives kind of a gravity model because in physics, the effect of gravity decreases as a function of the distance squared. So if you're twice as far away, the gravity goes down by one fourth if you're twice as far away. So cliff ord weights are another way that people have done it. Now, in Geoda, they don't have an option to do cliff ord weights, again, unless I've, I've just missed them somehow. But I recommend that no matter where you estimate your final model, whether it's in R or MATLAB or Python or Stata, I think it's a good idea to play with and define and look at your spatial weights in Joda. As I said before, it gives you a lot of tools to look at and see if those make sense. Look at the characteristics of those weights. And yes, there are other functions in other packages to do it, but Joda is a very nice implementation of this. So why should you? Well, here's my feeling. And again, this is just my feeling that what most packages, most code that people have written that I've seen do, because it's the simplest, is to just do k nearest neighbors. 
So why? Well, because all you have to do then is you just have to have for each region, you have to have a longitude and a latitude. And all you have to do then is create a matrix of distances between all regions and every other region. And then for each region, find, say, the five smallest to do a five nearest neighbor. It's very simple, very quick and easy to do. And you don't have to worry about reading in a shape or some other kind of geographic database file and figure out the GIS part of it, which regions actually touch which other regions, which regions share a boundary. And most people, hey, including me, we don't know how to program to do that kind of stuff, to read a, a geo database file and figure out which regions touch each other. But yeah, in about 10 minutes, I can whip together a spherical distance formula and I can figure out which regions are closer. A lot of people, because it's so easy, they encourage you just, oh, just use K nearest neighbors. It's good enough. It doesn't matter. I don't think that should be your default choice just because it's easy. I don't think anything when it comes to modeling. You should just do it the easy way. You should try to do it the right way. Whatever the right way means to you in your modeling context. I like Geoda because it gives you more options that are more likely to be more right for whatever it is you're studying. And again, this idea that you can visualize your spatial areas after they're defined, you can play with some different ones and see if what the result is of whatever choice you've made, see if it makes sense. See who are the neighbor of whom, see if most areas have two neighbors. We'll get into that when we get into Joda in just a couple of minutes. One last general comment about making spatial weights matrices. A lot of studies, especially studies, there are some trade studies I've seen, will not define neighbors based on geography. They'll define neighbors based on, say, how much countries trade with each other. Also, there are a lot of papers that will look at friend networks, say with the uh, National Longitudinal Survey of Youth. I think they have some questionnaires where they'll look at who is in your friend network and what are the characteristics of these friends. If you're defining non-spatial neighbors like this, be careful. Why? Well, because an assumption of these models when you're doing spatial econometrics is that these weights matrices are exogenous, that they are exogenously determined. Now, this is important. Let's just think about one particular example. Let's suppose you're doing a study on GDP or growth of a country, and um, you're defining neighbors based on how much countries trade with each other. Now, if you're going to be using either as a dependent variable or as an explanatory variable, something like exchange rate or education, you better be sure, you better really think carefully about whether people's trade patterns are really exogenous and independent of something like exchange rate or education. I would think there's probably going to be a relationship there. Similar with teenager's friend network, if you're looking at something like drug taking behavior and you're looking at whether a kid takes drugs and you want to know, is that impacted by whether a kid's friends take drugs? Well, kids and their friends network are defined endogenously. I think you choose your friends based on your common interests and maybe one of your common interests is uh, taking drugs. So you got to be really careful and think this through, because if you're violating the assumption of exogeneity, then you're going to run into problems. Now, a source on that is Lesage and Paste 2011 in the Review of Regional Studies. Again, this is an open access article. Goes into more detail about why that's important. Another thing in this paper they talk about that you might be interested in is what if you had two or more spatial relationships or weights or neighbors relationships you wanted to model? How does that work out? What are some things that you ought to think about? Check that article out if you want to read more about this exogeneity issue, some of the problems that can cause, or cases where you have two or more spatial weights matrices that you might be interested in using. Another very nice article that I ran into recently is Geddes and Aldstadt 2010 in Geographical Analysis. Here's a link. That's also open access article. They talk a lot about many different ways that you can define spatial weights matrices and some things to think about and be aware of and some also some very good sources in there to get you started if you want to dive much more deeply into spatial weights.
So we're gonna call this part one. And when we come back for part two, we're gonna dive into Geoda and we will create and look at some spatial weights. So join me for that next part. Thank you for watching.